Institute uh, Recovering Utility Commissioner from the state of Montana. Um, I've been more involved on the administrative regulation side, and the gentleman to my right have been involved in the Congress and the lawmaking side, now both in private practice. So I, I hope we make a, a, good, a good three up here to describe uh, the dimensions of the issue uh, today, uh, which is whether Congress can keep pace uh, with regulation when it comes to energy policy. Um, basically, run of the show here. Uh, we'll have a moderated discussion with me asking these two questions. I'll introduce them in just a second. Uh, and then uh, we'll take questions from you for about 15 minutes toward the end of the hour. Uh, joining me are Colin Hayes. He's the former staff director of Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He's a founding partner of Lot 16. And his right, Tom Hassenbohler, former chief counsel of Energy and Environment for the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee. He's now a partner with the Coefficient Group. Um, in order to maximize their candor today, uh, both of them are speaking on behalf only of themselves and not uh, of their clients. Uh, although I'm sure now that they're paid guns, they believe vigorously in, in everything they represent uh, on behalf of clients. Uh, ne nevertheless, uh, it, we, we, are, we have asked them here to kind of describe uh, how they work in their past roles and uh, how energy policy is made uh, up at the Capitol here. Um, each of them has worked as a staff member uh, for both members of Congress, uh, but mostly on congressional committees for more than a decade. Um, ENR and ENC, the two committees of jurisdiction over most of the energy sector, really trace their origins back uh, more than 200 years for each of the committees. Um, they're, they're some of the original committees of Congress. Uh, and that's interesting because the energy industry today has rarely seemed so dynamic. Um, America is going to become uh, a net energy exporter this year or next year, depending on how you measure the data. Um, and electricity use uh, has changed really dramatically uh, in the past decade alone, uh, with natural gas displacing coal, uh, more renewables this year being produced uh, than coal-fired energy uh, for the first time on a monthly basis ever. Uh, and we're seeing emerging technologies like storage uh, increasingly being interconnected uh, to the power grid. Um, so we'll, we'll kick it off with a fairly general question, which is, given your uh, two experience, uh, where, do you, where do you see us heading in terms of energy policy, and specifically, which energy policy item could use the most attention if you're someone up here at the Capitol working on either a, a reform or a new enactment? And Colin, we'll begin with you. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting us here, Travis, and thanks everyone for joining. I, uh, on that question, um, I think I'd go with uh, this, this concept of innovation in the energy sector. Um, it's uh, it's sort of a hilarious concept on some level, right? I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's desperately needed, but it's also sort of a coping mechanism for the, the tensions and the climate change. Conversation. I mean, that a lot of the ideas that the two parties, um, with with some independents involved as well up here on the hill, come up with are ruthlessly divisive. Uh, but innovation seems to bring everyone together. The single word. Now, what exactly people mean by that? Not clear. Uh, and like any um, sort of foundational concept for policy making, you know, when the when the details start to emerge. Um, on innovation, no different than if a mission reduction is your objective, uh, you start to get fissures. But I think it's, um, I think in terms of a constructive and useful and productive debate among policymakers, particularly up here on the Hill, it's, it's useful. It's not just a coping mechanism. It's a good point of departure for, for policymaking and it would certainly be my answer in terms of where folks ought to spend more time because there's the most common ground as it, as it relates to it. The, I do think there is an obligation on the part of, of folks who say they are for innovation to say what policy changes or what policy prescriptions they put on the table to facilitate it. I mean, it's everything from grant programs at the Department of Energy, um, funneled through and making use of pretty incredible system of national laboratories, all the way through to electricity market reforms, which have very little to do with you know, taxpayer-funded grant programs and more to do with the allocation of private capital. There are a lot of things that can be done 
to, to bolster innovation, and there are a lot of things that are being done to stymie innovation. And I, that strikes me as a more, a more interesting conversation um, for folks here on the Hill to be diving deep on how do you actually catalyze the innovation than to simply say it's the thing we need uh, to deal with, again, and for example, climate change, which dominates an awful lot of the conversation up here around energy policy. Before we move to Tom, uh, you know, a lot of innovation policy that I hear being pitched at the Capitol uh, often comes with sort of a preconceived technology that you should innovate around uh, and some kind of designated tax credit uh, or mandate to the national labs to somehow commercialize uh, a particular technology. So how do, you, how do you actually let, so to speak, innovators innovate with the innovation policy as opposed to coming to a predefined congressional solution on a technology innovation and then throwing tax policy at it or energy policy at it. Yeah, I, I think um, just as a, a policy construct, you need to create a situation where people are working to earn something. And in an ideal wor world, they are working to earn individual customers. And their success or failure is measured on that basis and not on the basis of the work they've done to earn subsidy dollars, for example. But I, I'm pragmatic. I realize that those subsidy dollars are a very real part of policy making. I mean, the, the, the history of energy policy and energy innovation, energy technology innovation, is replete with success stories of taxpayer-funded programs catalyzing change. And so I, you know, that's one area where uh, it's not always the case that the federal government or state or local governments ought to be creating these programs, but it is one thing that's interesting um, is, you know, we have loan guarantee programs, we have grant programs, we also have prize programs, increasingly at the federal level. Um, and particularly the loan guarantees, I mean, as compared to just writing a check in the form of a grant, but loan guarantees and also prize programs where not everyone's going to win. In fact, in some cases, only one person or one entity will win. Um, but it, you know, it creates a, a sort of crowdsourcing, if you will, to solve a problem. As a, as a policy matter, sort of if you force yourself away from you know, this sort of completely free market capitalist idea that isn't always practicable, designing those programs that use federal dollars um, in a way that, that supports rather than stifles competition uh, strikes me as uh, a thing that's pretty important. Tom, let's go to you. Big idea. Um, thanks, Travis, and thanks for having us. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics to kind of think think big and be optimistic on these on these matters. I think um, you know uh, systems change and energy is happening. I think at a much more uh, <coughs> as you mentioned at a faster pace. Uh, and 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 the, the kind of the threshold question of this panel, you know, can Congress ever keep up? Is, is, I think, something that um, every lawmaker, every committee uh, member um, struggles with. Like, how are they relevant? They're here to make a difference in Congress. They come in and they actually want to do things. And then they come and they find out, wow, it's hard. I have my like, strong partisan view. Um, increasingly today now, more than they did in the past, even though I think it's always been that way. It's just a lot more documented now with uh, social media. Um, you've got abilities to kind of you know, the, the, the idea of thinking big in Congress has been kind of um, sidelined, at least in the energy space, and that's been very frustrating to me as a staffer. I know it was frustrating for a lot of my bosses. I'm sure it was frustrating for Colin as well. Um, you know, I, I kind of grew up in the era when we were younger staffers of writing big energy bills. We did in the Energy Policy Act in 2005. We did a big one two years later in 2007, where um, these were big sweeping changes to the nation's cafe system, we did a big renewable fuel standard mandate, then we moved right into a cap and trade debate, we were talking about carbon and, and a national program. And then all of a sudden that, I mean, and that was a long process, that took you know, eight to ten years, and then when cap and trade um, died in the Senate, everybody just got real scared to do anything again, and we've been in that kind of funk for um, almost a decade now. And um, now I think um, the exciting thing, and even though I've got strong opinions on the, on the Green New Deal, um, what it's done is kind of ripped the cord off, thinking big again. And it's a lot of people on both sides to say, you know what, it's not crazy to think a big idea and actually like have some vision for Congress. And that's what I think we've been missing 
Um, and so building on Colin's point on innovation, you know, on the right, there's a lot of discussion about what that means as we kind of move into this system framework of energy change. And you've got competitive forces in energy that are trying to unleash, you know, new technologies, new powers, new ability to create new services for people and for consumers. You've got uh, climate risk it being embedded into every decision-making um, factor that is happening now in, 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 in people's business, whether you're a shareholder or a small business or a startup. Um, and then you've got the increasing use of digital technologies and digitization and data that's really changing things. Um, and Congress is never going to be able to keep up with that. I mean, let's get real. But um, can they actually set some parameters to unlock some of this in a way that hasn't been done before? I think the answer is resoundingly yes. Um, how do you do that is, a, is, a, is the fun part. And I think um, it, it starts with thinking big, and then it starts with, I think, looking at how existing laws are erecting barriers to that system change that's trying to push out from the market and letting the market value things like climate risk in a way that wasn't capable of doing maybe five, ten years ago with the proliferation of new data technologies and new abilities to perform that. So all of these is a long-winded way of saying, yes, there's some opportunities. I think it's going to take a vision, and I think both parties are going to have a very different vision, but perhaps there is ability um, for some of these statutes that were, a lot of them haven't been systematically looked at since the 1930s, the uh, Federal Power Act all the way down to, you know, some of the recent changes even 10 years ago from 2005. <coughs> it's a long time to, to not have a, um, a holistic look at these things. So um, I, I'm an optimist and I think that that's a, you know, hopefully we can build on these, these points as we talk about different ways to um, build and, and, and kind of uh, find the right intersections that actually have some bipartisan appeal. So in, in the 1930s, uh, network industries were subject to a number of statutory enactments along with the New Deal that, that you alluded to. And one thing that always strikes me is that uh, contemporaneous with the Federal Power Act that governs the electricity sector, uh, you have the Telecommunications Act passed around the same time. And those two sectors now look radically different. I mean, one of them has become uh, much more competitive, something that started off as just voice telephony, um, uh, became, in, in, some, in no small part, through congressional enactments, yeah. like the 96 Telecom Act, uh, really kind of exploded in terms of consumer product differentiation. And now you've got a situation where the phone company, the cable company, they're, they're all just kind of broadband companies um, and looking completely different than it had before. Meanwhile, in, in energy, the electric utilities of the 1930s still fundamentally kind of have the same look to them uh, as, as they do today. Um, so even if, as you have these appeals to innovation, it, it's, it's, it's hard to see necessarily the dial moving on fundamental business model changes like it has in certain other industries. So what, I mean, is that... I mean, maybe maybe you can both just quickly reply. Is that more to do with just sort of the basic physics of the industry, or do you think it's a problem of statutory and regulatory barriers to innovation primarily? Sure. <laughs> Colin gets to be philosophical first. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I, I guess I, I'm probably biased. I mean, I my knee-jerk reaction is to to respond to that by saying it's a statutory issue. I, I, I the reality is it's some combination of, of the two, right? I mean, the, the transmission of electrons is a fundamentally different engineering question than the transmission of one voice for a telephone call. Um, and so I don't think you can take that for granted, but, um, and there hasn't been as much sort of enabling technological change in the electricity sector as there has in the telecommunications sector. So there's, there is that aspect. But I am certain that there are, and, and Tom spends a lot of time on this question, existing statutory barriers to innovation and change. Um, so I'm, I may defer to him on that. I, I think the, in terms of what causes um, Congress to do anything about that in the interest of innovation, or environmental performance improvements, uh, any sort of goal that one might have um, on these issues. 
you know, there's, there's really two things, but both of which are obvious, um, but worth pointing out. One is the really the absence of a crisis. If you don't have gasoline prices that are high, if you don't have a blackout somewhere with people lacking electricity, energy in general, electricity in particular, very easy for people to take for granted, right up until they're not in a position to do that. And so it's you know it's a little bit of a cliche to, to say that you know legislating requires a crisis, and no one ought to be rooting for such a thing. But but I I believe there is a responsibility of the committee's jurisdiction to try to prevent those things from happening by conducting oversight of the agencies that are responsible for prevent, preventing blackouts or responsible for keeping prices low or responsible for doing both of those things. But there's also a responsibility of those committees to ponder scenarios in which a failure occurs and to be ready with what they would change in the United States Code in response to those crises. Um, and, and you see them, right? I mean, you see wildfires in California because we're not, like, trimming the vegetation properly. Like, that feels pretty fixable. Um, and there's, like, there's like eight versions of legislative text. I mean, we lost, like, you know, how many months of our lives trying to get agreement between the chambers and the parties on vegetation management for transmission lines years ago when Tom and I both worked up here. Um, but you, you need a catalyst that oftentimes comes in the form of a, of a crisis. Again, either high gasoline prices, um, you know, blackout. I, I, think, I think that or recognition of that reality is why uh, so much of the rhetoric around climate change is biased towards sort of crisis-oriented words, right? Because people get it. That, and unless you talk about a thing that's likely to occur 20, 50, 100 years from now in a way that <laughs> makes it real and makes it unpleasant now, people won't do anything about it until 20 or 50 or 100 years from now. So that's, that's one observation um, around sort of this difference between sort of technological barriers or, or statutory barriers. I do think it's the latter in many respects. I don't think it changes unless there is a crisis of some kind. The last one I'd list is that voters, constituents, are just ticked off. Like, they don't have the choice they want in how their energy is produced or where it comes from or even how it's transmitted. Uh, they're just angry about it. And so they pick up their phone and they call their congressman. And I, I've never seen anything get done on the Hill, at least in the energy space, because it was a means to recognizing some aspirational, more wonderful world than the one we currently live in. It is almost always in response to people being ticked off or inconvenienced or harmed in some way. Um, and, and the other thing I would say that's, that's fairly mundane, um, but real, particularly for the committee's jurisdiction, with which Tom and I are most familiar. And that is just the shelf life on the statutory authorities. I mean, you look at the National Defense Authorization Act, which both chambers are in the process of trying to advance. It gets done every year because it expires on an annual basis. Uh, and the Appropriations Committee, you know, in partnership with the Authorizing Committee, works in partnership uh, as it relates to national security and what spending is authorized and what spending uh, is, is appropriated. That isn't true uh, in a lot of other areas. It certainly isn't true in the energy space, that sort of symbiotic relationship between authorizing activities of the federal government and subsequently funding them. You look at the Coast Guard Reauthorization Act. It comes up and gets done. Flood insurance. Uh, the Water Resources Development Act at EPW is, is on this sort of two-year clock. I guess you've got pipeline safety reauthorization, yeah. but that's really kind of the only thing. There's nothing nothing like that for, say, electricity. Well, and the, and the FEMSA stuff isn't jurisdictional the committee I used to work at. And so, you, you know, you look, at, you look at what's going on at that committee, uh, and they really, the highway bill, same deal, right? It expires. You've got to go back and reauthorize it. And it's, it's, again, it's a very mundane thing. It's sort of deeply in the weeds and institutional. But, you know, when you look at the system as a whole and you look at, you know, the reason why FERC has this authority to begin with, they are just trying to do their job. And 
making sure markets are going to work, they're going to be just and reasonable, they're going to be fair to consumers, they're, and that involves setting rules that potentially have um, impacts on state and local um, communities that may or may not have been the case before. And so those are going to be the things that really, I think, FERC needs some direction from Congress to help on, whether it's through oversight, letters, or through potential legislation. I think all three of them are going to be needed eventually. Right now, we're on the first two. I think legislation is building over the next several years for that. Colin, is, is delegation a problem? And second, uh, what techniques can lawmakers use to get FERC to exercise essentially their legislative prerogative, albeit indirectly? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't agree with, disagree with, with anything Tom said, which is to say, no, it's not a problem. It's a, it's a pretty central feature of, you know, the three branches of government working together, you know, and then, uh, you know, you wind up in the courts, uh, the third of the three, if somebody somewhere thinks that the agency has, has stepped outside of any that Congress created for them. I, I mean, occasionally, as it relates to like the legislative drafting that occurs, the authority is too broad. I mean, that you, there are, there are, but that's, even that's subjective, right? I mean, I can sit here and, and recite for you places where I think the United States Code ought to be more specific, and you could walk down the hall and find 20 people, members of Congress, that disagree with me, and their opinion matters a lot more than mine does. Um, but I, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a common feature I do think it, it it has real potential to become a problem, though, in the absence of, of effective oversight. Um, and I'd, I'll spend just some time on that. Uh, the, the last thing I'd say, though, is as to whether or not it's a problem. Again, it is a it's a pretty central feature of legislating. I mean, Congress um, can oftentimes get itself sort of eighty. 90, 95% of the way through to the answer on a policy question or a problem and secure the votes that are required to make some associated change. But that last 5% can be technically challenging, politically challenging. You, know, you may just run out of time to answer the question. I mean, you know, two years is a long time, but that is officially how long a Congress lasts. And some of these things you know, we'll, I mean, look at how long it takes to start and finish a rulemaking these days at the federal level. Uh, so there's a pragmatism, political and otherwise, to the delegation of authority that, that, that occurs. Al although there's been a lot of it over the years, and in some cases I would say there's been too much. As it relates to oversight, again, I think Tom has nailed it as the sort of most recent um, departure from the Senate here on the panel, I would provide a Senate-specific answer to that, which is the people are policy. And you could spend all the time in the world drafting just the most perfect statutory authority. And if someone who disagrees with you is put in charge of implementing it, it's not going to go the way you were hoping for. Uh, and so the, the role of the Senate um, in providing advice and consent on the people that the president nominates to run independent boards and commissions like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or departments like the Department of Energy. Um, critically important. Uh, always has been. I, I think there's an increasing awareness of it, almost a dysfunctional awareness of it at this point, as you know, the, the Senate devotes most of its time to deciding whether or not people are going to be confirmed. Um, it's a you know it's a 400 level HR department, um, and and it, it reflects the fact that like those are really important decisions because people are policy, and I, the thing I think that members and staff can do to engage more actively in that process, and get from from the executive branch whatever it is they might be working for is to engage in it earlier, it is advice and consent. And so the importance of relationships between members, particularly in the Senate, where the nominations will be received, heard, and voted on, that communication between the President and members of the Senate is really important. They all have, you know, there's 50 states, they're full of people. Some of them might be incredibly good nominees. And the White House ought to be hearing from the folks who ultimately be voting on those nominees as to who they think is most qualified. And that happens. 
not saying it doesn't happen, but that's the earliest moment in, in th this idea that people are policy where Congress can be engaged. Uh, and I think sometimes, because there's so many people who get nominated to these positions, even committees find themselves sort of back on their heels. Like, oh, we, we have like eight people we got to hear from at a nomination hearing today. And we know three of the eight, but we're only now just getting to know the other five. Um, that's, a, that's a thing that committees and committee staff work to solve for and need to keep working to solve for, because it's, it's um, like I said, if, if you get the wrong people uh, in, in positions, um, if you want the laws that Congress has enacted in a certain way, Sort of a, a Senate-related follow-up to that. I mean, you've got for Senate DNR, uh, you've got uh, secretarial agencies like Interior that are led by sort of a single-member political appointment, and then a lot of uh, uh, people underneath them like the GC and others. Uh, and then you've got FERC, this uh, bipartisan independent commission. Um, from the perspective of being a kind of Republican committee in a Republican administration, is it easier to influence outcomes in one agency or another? And what differences and techniques would you bring to the table uh, regarding the different structures of the, the agencies that have authority and energy? Yeah, I mean, the, I guess as, as a sort of oversimplification, easier to implement just a secretary-led agency, right? I mean, you've got if the Senate is controlled by the same party as the White House, right? You're from beginning, middle to end in the confirmation process, and otherwise you have a ton of interaction and ideological alignment, presumably. Um, where you know a commission, you know, you're not relying on a, a single secretary to implement, to interpret and implement the existing laws. You've got to, you know, you've got to find the votes to prevail. The fact that independent boards and commissions have a majority of, of commissioners. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Um, a majority of folks from the president's party, um, you know, s serving at them simplifies things. But, you know, anytime you need to find votes, that's more complicated. If, you know, whether it's on the Hill or on the commission, that's more complicated than, you know, finding the phone number for a cabinet secretary. And I've Dusting off my old Senate hat, I did uh, I did a couple years in uh, EPW, and and you know it's like one of those things where you have two parties and different control. I was there when I worked for Senator Inhofe, and we confirmed um, you know Gina McCarthy and Lisa Jackson to the EPA, and I think those people are or policy. I think is a, the, um, is, is is the right way to frame it. I think those in times of divided government, you know that those relationships that are m built even with two parties, you may think that those two forces may be very, um, that they may be violently opposed to a lot of the policies, but those personal relationships that you gather through the confirmation process is often your only lever to that agency to make sure, especially in a divided government, that you as a member are being heard and that you're representing your constituents, whether it's the state of Oklahoma, the state of Florida, whatever, and in a, in a divided government is very, very important. And so that that can't get undersold as much as the, um, the only thing that keeps is keeping kind of um, our government responsive to the elected officials of the legislature. So, um, yeah, the, the confirmation process is the ultimate, um, and I, I've seen it firsthand too. And I agree. It's the, you know, the House has its roles in, in writing the perfect legislation and sending us all its messages. But at the end of the day, it's 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 the executors that are actually doing the job. So, uh, we'll turn to the audience in just one moment and get your questions. <coughs> but first, a, a quick take question. And then I'll conclude with, with one that is a little more, um, well, equally meaty, but ask you for a slightly longer response. Um, you know, citing to the lack of federal action, you've got states, cities, even individual corporations uh, taking a lot of actions in the electricity sector, pushing for 100% clean energy targets by a date certain, and really exercising kind of policy controls that uh, are creating a system that may end up looking quite a bit different jurisdiction to jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, there's no real unified, standardized marketplace, even for things like renewable energy credits. 
because uh, they have a different meaning in different jurisdictions. Um, so here's the quick take, and you can elaborate if you can fit it into another question. But the, the quick take question is, are we going to see in the next 10 years an energy landscape for electricity specifically that is more federalized, or are we going to continue having a kind of state balkanization? More federalized or stay the same column? It's easier to see a situation where the states are the sort of big actors and the feds are, are lagging or monitoring what's going on in the states. Agree, disagree? Um, moderately agree, but I think the, the, fed, the, and back to my first comment about Green New Deal ripping the court off, thinking big thoughts again, it's going to need some federal parameters that um, enable this system, otherwise it's not going to work as efficiently and effectively as it could. So I still think we're um, overdue for some federal intervention. And, and that leads neatly into a question where you can elaborate just a little bit more, which, which it, assuming there are things that need to be done in order to sort of rationalize the system, what additional legal authority or delegation should Congress give FERC or another agency to do something that ought to be done on energy policy? That's the uh, trap door for people who say they, that more yeah, power should be delegated to <laughs> agencies. Uh, we know the audience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Travis, you and I have discussed this a little bit. I, I, I have become fond of this idea as it relates to FERC that they, FERC's very good at ensuring reliable, affordable electricity. Um, and they have sufficient legal authority to, to make sure those are the two outcomes. And those attributes are very well defined. We, you know, the lights are either on or they are off. And if they're off, one might say that's not very reliable electric service. Uh, and if you have angry constituents calling to the hill about the electric bills they're receiving, well, that's not just or reasonable, at least in the eyes of the person who got the bill, right? So I think those attributes are defined or definable, understood. I like the idea that it's okay to identify and define additional attributes um, that you ask market forces to price and solve for. Uh, the one that uh, FERC, depending on who you ask, uh, lacks a real sort of open road situation to, to go work on is the environmental performance of the electric generation. They can work on the affordability of it, they can work on the reliability of it, but the environmental attributes associated with it, um, they don't they don't have most people would would assert they don't really have what they need to run with that. Some folks, states' rights advocates, start there as a Republican, but don't want them to have that because they're fine with the patchwork that you've alluded to. States are the laboratories of democracy. Let them have at it. And like the federal government should just keep it affordable and reliable, period. Stay out of the rest of it. Um, but I, I think that um, those environmental issues are decidedly global in nature. At a minimum, it's, it's safe and accurate to say that they are national in nature as policy questions. They're not confined to a single state. You got to deal with them in all 50, or you, or, or you haven't really addressed the issue, and so I, that's one where the authority doesn't really exist to do some things that would be interesting and pretty impactful as it relates to the environmental performance of the of the U.S. energy system. And Tom, um, yeah, I think you know we don't have to your rec comment. I mean, we don't have 50 different labels for food, you know, and what goes into you know your your products. We, we, the reason why we have different, you know, is because we don't have federal leadership, federal issues and federal leadership on this issue. And I, I, you know, I think the time it was debated last, there wasn't enough consensus on these issues. I'm not saying that there may be, we have more now, but we certainly have a lot more of an interest to, to move into this direction. I think what does, what, what, what needs to be focused on, uh, to me, is um, I think, you know, looking at right, what are the parameters for, for the Congress to act in this space, recognizing that we've got a lot of new technologies? 
to me, data and um, the data issue uh, is is not um, you know how how data is utilized in the system. Um, you know who gets to collect it, who gets to own it, um, and, and this is energy data, emissions data, things that are being collected um, across the energy supply chain. There's a lot of need for some you know, systematic consistency here. It's often siloed or deep proprietary. It's the certification systems are not consistent. Um, so, you know, that's that reeks for kind of some kind of federal um, at least solution on this, and it's something that I think is going to be you're going to be folks will be hearing a lot more about that intersection of um, information technology data and the energy system and how that works in this country that is supposed to be united as uh, even though all energy and politics are local, and these are not necessarily 50 state solution answers. So I think something along those lines, who is the right agency to do that? It, this broke at the, if you recall in the FAST Act, we gave DOE lead authority over cybersecurity, and we actually did some things and tried to get a little bit ahead of this, but we have left a lot open in where this goes, and so it's gonna be really interesting to see in the next energy climate bill context how some of these issues get sorted out. I do think that it's very right, get only riper in the next three to five years. I could ask any number of follow-up questions on those two enticing answers to draw out uh, more of uh, those ideas, but let's turn to the audience now and see if uh, anyone has questions. Sure, let's go back here and then we'll go. Uh, in your all's opinion, how important are programs like the ARPA program uh, when it comes to innovation? It was touched on early, um, but you know, the last 10 years have been big on it. It'll probably even be bigger in the next 10 years. Like, how important are programs like that for this innovation? I mean, very important. I mean, it, it takes, uh, you know, particularly on the innovation question, as I said at the outset, you know, pragmatism and just, you know, shots on goal require you to have some portfolio of, of programs that you're you're putting against this, this need for innovation. ARPA E is, is a pretty cool one. Interesting one, absolutely devoted to basic science and R and D and and breakthroughs and solving for specific questions. So I'd say very important and useful and some really interesting success stories out of it. Yeah, I mean they're important, but I also think unlocking the market through changes in policy to um, have more competitive forces that can unlock a lot of these kind of new technologies that are trying to get out is equally important. And so um, the focus on kind of DC answers of like setting up a program and funding it while, again, um, certainly move the needle and are helpful, I think a bigger question in today's kind of evolving energy landscape is how, how are we creating barriers to these, um, you know, to, as we start to look forward. So the answer isn't always in a new program. Rich Heidorn, RTO Insider, EORO Insider. We cover the regional transmission organizations and NERF and so forth. The people we talk to uh, do not say, because I can wrap up a snowball here in Washington, D.C., there is no climate change. Is that penetrating members of Congress? Are you seeing evidence that, um, and you mentioned you work for Senator Rich, I said no. Um, are you seeing evidence that this is getting through to people here in D.C.? That, that yeah. we, we do have a, a crisis. I, I mean, yes. I, I mean, look at my old, I mean, my last boss was Chairman Walden and uh, Fred Upton. Um, you know, they started off the, the year um, in hearings with the Democrats taking over the House, acknowledging climate is real, not wanting to have a, a science debate anymore. Um, and I think focusing on what is the solution now. And, and I think that's, while it may seem small to, to some folks, I think it is a big step in now we're able to, again, with the concurrence of the Green New Deal and folks trying to figure out what that means for the future, Republicans need to be on the same side of, of, of figuring out what their solution is. And again, we, we, we touched on, on innovation, but I think there's a lot more that the markets can do or that, that they're not doing right now, and that these are the kind of things that uh, members are looking at to respond to climate, yeah, and to respond to um, not just their constituents, but you know, Fortune 500 companies who have all valued this in their portfolios and are responding to their shareholders and showing, demonstrating how they're looking at climate risk. And that goes from just not just tech companies, but to oil and gas and fossil companies as well. So, yeah, I've seen a very um, dramatic change in the last uh, 
seven, eight years, especially, but really the last three years. So. Yeah, I think that's right. And the, the shift in rhetoric is, is usually a leading indicator of, of policy change. I mean, if people start talking about an issue differently as members of Congress, it, it's, as long as they remain in office, it often follows that they start voting differently on issues. And then it's a conversation about the policy prescription and what it takes to get the requisite number of yes votes that make an actual change. That conversation is underway now in a, in a more um, sort of energized way than, than it has been, in my estimate. Questions? Yeah, uh, behind you, yeah. We'll, we'll yeah, go um, out of Nebraska, the Third Day Network. I wanted to know um, what lessons could be learned from the legislative failure of the cap and trade bill, and if you believe that this policy avenue is effective in mitigating climate change. Um, hmm, all right, so what lessons can be learned? Uh, you know, I mean, the cap and trade failure was a, was a unique one. It's, I think the lesson to be learned was if, if the other side compromised a little more, they would have gotten it done. So compromise, I mean, you had coalitions out the wazoo on, this, on that bill. They had a lot of grunt work, and it was, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the media interpretation is, you know, Obama picked health care and made his, you know, play on that versus climate. And I think that while in the trenches in Congress during those years, I think that may have had something to do with it, but at the end of the day, it had more to do with the lack of compromising on the proponent side who really wanted that done, and their um, kind of one-size-fits-all solution was not, they didn't want to see the Senate, you know, where I worked at the time, um, really shape that bill in a way that was different from the original sort of waxman marky proposal. So, um, and then is cap and trade, a, is that a question, is it a useful tool? Yes. Um, you know, Republicans supported it um, in the, back in the day of three Ps, three pollutants. If you look a little bit back into 2003 and five, there was the, you know, the, the uh, you know, how, how the Clean Air Act evolved, frankly, is a, is a cap and trade um, plan. The problem, I think, with it back then was it was too big, too fast, and not quite um, baked enough to, uh, and, it's, and it did lasting damage, frankly, on the brand of cap and trade, which is an efficient way of, of, of managing, um, you know, carbon pollution, potentially. So, um, and you, you, so you've got examples all across the states and in other parts of the world that have cap and trade programs, and we don't talk about that barely at all anymore here. So, could that be a, a potential piece of a pie in the future? I still think it could come back, but it's never going to be the, the lead in a, in a climate bill again. One of the forgotten lessons is that it wasn't Republicans who killed that. Um, yes, that's very true. Um, it's demonstrably true. I mean, it passed the House. It came over to the Senate at the time, controlled by Dems. I believe Dems still had a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. But this, that gave them the votes they needed on health care. didn't give them the votes they needed on cap and trade because the, of the regional nature of these issues. I mean, that was... Is Kennedy had lost in the polarization um, of this climate conversation, which a lot of people are incentivized to exacerbate, not alleviate. Um, but it wasn't Republicans who killed cap and trade. It was it was a really a procedural decision, a political decision on the part of, of Majority Leader Reid to simply not bring it to the floor. Uh, why didn't he bring it to the floor? Because he knew that they didn't have the votes, presumably. Um, that's a forgotten lesson. The, the, the other lessons are, again, the, the regional nature of these issues. I mean, the, the impact, I mean, just start with coastal states and, and everyone else, like population centers in rural areas. I mean, the, a lot of these energy and environmental issues and the, the costs and the, even if you know, over the long term, the benefits vastly outweigh them. The costs that impose are in the near term. Who, who shoulders those? A lot of that breaks out on a, on a regional basis. And I think people sort of lost sight of that um, in the heat of the moment. Um, and then the harsh reality of it hit when they started counting, counting votes in the Senate. Um, the other lesson, I think, is the, you know, I don't, I don't actually know if cap and trade is, is it, it could work. There's no question. I mean, you could you could enact cap and trade and implement it. Complex.
and reduce greenhouse gas emissions for sure. The, the other lesson I think that, that ought to be learned from that experience though is just some humility about we don't, we don't really know, right? I mean, th and th that's a pretty healthy development that's materialized since cap and trade failed to get enacted, which is a lot of conversation about a sectoral approach where you recognize these sort of technological, regulatory, and economic differences between a power plant on the one hand and a car on the other. Uh, carbon tax, where you know, you're, you're, you're providing a price signal and just the source in an ideal world stepping away from it and letting the market do what it does as far as the allocation of private capital is concerned. Um, just basic electricity market reforms, right? I mean, there's been a, that conversation has flourished. And, I mean, there was some real sort of pain and mourning that I think a lot of people who put tons of time and energy into to all the different cap and trade bills went through. But on the other side of that, a very constructive, humble, and useful conversation about, well, I don't know, is it the right thing to do? Yeah. And you gotta evaluate that question from a bunch of different Perspectives. Do you have a vote? That's the number one question up here, anyway. Um, and then, is it going to accomplish the object, the stated objective, in the most affordable, sort of least disruptive way for the people who are going to be on the receiving end of the changes it, it causes? Um, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that could, that debate is alive and well up here. I think that's a good thing. Okay. Last question goes to Gavin. Sure. Um, I wanted to touch on the RTO stakeholder processes at FERC, um, especially since the NRG decision a couple weeks ago. These are really, those, the RTO stakeholder processes are really what shape the decisions that FERC has to make, right? Um, Tom, Travis, I know you guys have been active in trying to reform these stakeholder processes and trying to get FERC to acknowledge that they need reform. Uh, can you just lay out a little bit what those things are for people here and then, you know, what problems you see with some incumbents that may be kind of rule the roost in these processes and how you want to see it change? Um, sure. I think, you know, and for those that don't follow electricity markets that closely, I think this goes, to take it up one notch, this goes to this kind of delegation of authority question, I think, in an ultimate way. Um, you know, RTOs, you know, as, as Gavin said, have, have kind of, have existed to be the operators um, and more the policy takers, not the makers. But yet, um, frankly, in my opinion, because of a lack of leadership from both Congress and the FERC and, and this rapidly evolving grid, you've got new players coming into the system um, that have not been or, or, or were not there when the RTOs were created. Um, and you've also got um, customers who are getting much more active in um, wanting to control what happens to their either their power plant, either their facilities or their industrial um, processes. They have their own um, carbon plans, they have their own climate goals. Um, and so um, how, you know, this, this kind of confluence is, is really forcing um, some real existential issues for some of the RTOs, and not all of them, I just say this at a very high level, but um, there, there hasn't been a systematic look at this in a while, and that's the, um, um, one of the issues that, um, you know, was surfaced in the, uh, in the FERC oversight hearing on June 12th was this interest from members of Congress in, you know, hearing from their constituents on these issues, and you know why hasn't you know FERC or or the Congress taken a more uh, systematic look at this? Because the answer is because it's hard, it's complex, it's all the usual. Like they've got plenty of stakeholder. You know, you go to PJM's website, you can see plenty of different um, meetings on a weekly basis that everybody has to go through. But no one, what can be benefited from this kind of look at is, and I think it will inform the future of energy policy and the, on the electricity space is. What's not being looked at is kind of the macro impacts of where these um, stakeholder process, processes are breaking down. And that's causing kind of FERC to have some bottlenecks right now, and it's causing FERC to really um, be at a crossroads themselves on how much they push back on the RTO decision-making processes from the top down versus the bottom up. You know, FERC, as Chairman Shatter do greatly, and so does every commissioner greatly, wants to see these things bubble up through from the bottom up through the process. But the process is under duress, and, and because the system is changing, and it's not because it's their fault, it's just the system is changing. So um, I do think that that is something that is going, you're going to hear more about as, as Congress um, continues to look at that, um, both on and, and the House, Senate, and the FERC side, and I hope that um, that will lead to some parameter, maybe discussions. It's not going to be very minute details of Congress figuring out what stakeholder process is and who works for what, but 
putting some sunshine around these issues and being able to have a conversation is at least the first step in building up a much maybe larger discussion. Yeah. So, for, so Congress isn't legislating, so it expects its delegation to FERC to work. FERC isn't providing the vision and kicks it downstairs to RTOs, the three-letter acronym many people up here probably haven't even heard of. And the question is, do we really want this board making policy? Yeah, who's accountable and who's, you know, who's ultimately accountable is the question. So. Uh, let's thank our panelists for joining us today. Thank you for being here.